Hey guys, in this video I am going to break down William Shakespeare's Sonnet 18 line by line. This sonnet is called Sonnet 18 just because it was the 18th sonnet he wrote in a series of 154 sonnets. A lot of people also call it though uh, by its first line, which is shall I compare thee to a summer's day. Um, I'll probably break this down quatrain by quatrain, so I'll go four lines at a time. But I recommend at first that you pause this video and read the poem through one or two times just so you've got an idea of what, what the poem's about. Before we move on, there's another video I recorded that breaks down what a sonnet is. I recommend you watch that first if you haven't um, already watched that or if you don't know what a sonnet is. But let's move forward with this sonnet, Sonnet 18. And these are just the first uh, four lines. And as a reminder, the rhyme scheme is marked there on the right. The, the rhyme scheme is pretty easy to follow. Lines that rhyme are just indicated by a letter. So lines one and three here rhyme. That's why there are A's in parentheses on the right. And the second and fourth line, they also rhyme. And that's why there's that B. Um, all right, so the way that this poem begins there's basically a rhetorical question at the start, and the question is, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So thee is, you know, a, a pronoun Shakespeare uses for you. So he's basically saying, shall I compare you to a summer's day? So in this entire poem, he's basically answering that question. So he's, he's asking, should I compare you to summer or a day during summer? And then the next 13 lines are going to seek to answer that question, basically. And we'll see, you know, where he goes with this. Obviously, before I keep looking at the next lines, one thing I would recommend is anytime you come across an, a word that's maybe archaic and we don't use today, I would look it up. The other thing is you need to get used to the some of the words that Shakespeare uses that you might just not be familiar with if you're not used to reading Shakespeare. For example, this second line, it says, thou art more lovely and more temperate. Thou is basically you, and art, you know, he's not talking about painting pictures, it's just are. So he's basically saying, you are more lovely and more temperate. Temperate meaning mild, because summer could be too hot, and that's not always a good thing. So to start off, the question is posed, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And almost in the second line, he's sort of saying, well, you're better than summer. You're more lovely and more temperate. He says, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. So sometimes there's, you know, it's windy in, in May. And then he also says, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. And that's basically a metaphor um, comparing summer is basically just, you know, it's leasing a part of the year. You know, if you, you might run a house, you don't own it. Well, summer doesn't own the year, the year. It only gets, you know, a few months. And so, so far, whoever Shakespeare is writing to, which, you know, there's debate about who that was. It could have been a female. A lot of people think it was maybe a young male. Maybe it's even just metaphorical. We don't really know. But so far, he's basically saying, you know, this person, in comparison to all of this stuff, might be better. If we move forward to the second quatrain, which again, a quatrain is a grouping of four lines. So these are lines five, six, seven, and eight in the poem. He continues on by saying basically negative things about uh, about sorry uh, summer. So he says, sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. And so here he's basically saying that you know, summer could be too hot. Also, it's it's dimmed, meaning it goes away, the sun goes down, and every fair from fair sometimes declines, meaning fair is another word for beautiful. So even though the summer could be a beautiful time, you know, it ends up going away. It doesn't last forever, and eventually summer leads to fall, which leads to winter, and it's long gone by that point. Moving forward to the third quatrain, and then finally the couplet, the last couplet of the poem. This is a moment where the poem kind of shifts. There's a transition. This is called the volta in a poem. In a, in a sonnet, it's the ninth line typically. It occurs in the third stanza where things shift. So, you know, if you were to go back to the last two quatrains, 
basically Shakespeare is asking, should I compare you to Summer's Day? And then he lists all these bad things about Summer. Here in Quatrain th uh, 3, there is a shift where he starts talking more specifically about the subject of the poem, you know, whoever it is that he's making this comparison with. And so he says, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. So thy means you. And if you look up the word eternal, something that is eternal is something that lasts forever. So an eternal summer, he's almost again making a, a metaphor here that whoever he's writing about is basically like a summer that lasts forever. You know, it shall not fade. And then he continues in line 10, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Meaning that last word is like owns or like that you that you own. So he's saying that this person doesn't lose possession of the beauty that they have, the beauty that they own. It's eternal. Nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou gross. These last two lines are really interesting. And in general, what Shakespeare is doing here is really, I think, while well, poetic, but also interesting uh, because Shakespeare is basically enshrining this person in writing. And I hate to uh, spoil the sort of, I guess, uh, surprise of this poem, but a lot of poets during Shakespeare's time sort of wrote about this concept of preserving people and preserving life through writing. Um, you know, 400 years ago, nobody was guaranteed to live for a long time. So a lot of writing sort of dealt with death and how life was so um, temporary. And a lot of ways that people dealt with that was by writing and you get to preserve somebody. So if you look at these last, well, not the last two lines, but the last two lines of Quatrain 3, Shakespeare is basically saying that death, he's personifying death, and he's saying that death would not brag if he took you. You know, why would death be happy to take somebody so worthy and beautiful? And then he says, this is he being Shakespeare, he says, when in eternal lines to time thou gross. So he's almost saying, Eternal lines, think of lines of a poem. And Shakespeare is basically saying that you grow by these lines that I'm writing right now. And, you know, 400 plus years later, people like us are reading these lines. And so in a weird mic drop moment, Shakespeare's right. And then we look at the final couplet. Um, oftentimes the couplet, the last two lines, kind of leave us with something to think about or they might leave us with an answer. And I really like these two uh, lines right here. Shakespeare says, So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and gives life to thee. And basically what Shakespeare's saying there, this is actually the true mic drop. Uh, he's saying, as long as people are alive, right? They can breathe, they can see. Um, and as long as this, you know, he says, so long lives this. When he's talking about this, He's talking about this poem. So he's saying, as long as this poem lives, it gives life to, to thee, to you. So basically, if I were to summarize this poem, it's Shakespeare saying, should I compare you to, the, to a summer's day? And he ends up saying, well, no, because there are all these good things about summer, but there's also some bad. And he ends up pretty much saying, like, you're, you're better than summer. You're basically all the best parts of summer but perpetually, eternally, you're the best parts that last forever and you're going to live forever basically because I'm writing this poem about you. And Shakespeare proves right because it's 2020 and we're talking about it right now.